I wanted to be a petroleum engineer because I was really good in math and I graduated from college with a degree in economics and a minor in math. And I came to Houston looking for a job and found one. They said, we want somebody who's really good at math. And it ended up being working for five men, petroleum engineers. And I picked up what they did real quick. Uh, this whole case really impacted my life. It, it encompassed about a third of my adult life. I went from being very naive and trusting to rather jaded. You feel personally attacked. You feel personally like you've been shamed in public. They, they expose things about your life, your children, your finances, just very invasive. And there's no way to get away from it being personal. And it, 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 it's non-ending and it just builds and builds and it gets bigger and bigger, it kind of takes over. This whole experience totally changed my life. It's not at all what I planned. It hurt my children because uh, both of my children, my, my oldest son has ADHD and severe anxiety and my younger son has some issues also. And they, even if I didn't talk about it, they could see the toll and the hours and the deadlines and uh, they just knew. I mean, and my oldest is brilliant and he understood it for the entire 11 years. His questions were amazing to me uh, and they were my biggest support network. They told me I had to do it. You know, I never intended uh, to be a trailblazer, but I, I realize that I am. What I'd like to say about this whole experience and the outcome is that what will live into perpetuity is the uh, Texas Supreme Court brief and the company's SEC filing that said they misappropriated my trade secret. I understand that it's just numbers to them. It's just money. Uh, you know, the people that were involved, it won't impact them. But for me, I won and I persevered and other people can do it. In order to win a case, it is imperative that you have attorneys that listen. Sometimes that's hard for attorneys. You're in this to win together. And uh, Perry Zivley, and, and the appellate attorney, Greg Smith, they listened to me, they, they respected me. And without both of them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have won. And I know that. Toby Berry Helfen's key influence in her life was her maternal grandfather, Abe Katz, whose many family members died in the Holocaust. He always told her she could accomplish anything if she got an education, was honest, treated people fairly, stayed humble, worked hard, and set her mind to achieving her goals. She was his first grandchild and was named after his mother, Toba, which in Hebrew means good. She was brought up believing in education, hard work, telling the truth, and not being a quitter. She graduated from the University of Texas and then went on to get her master's in petroleum engineering, one of only three women in her class while working full-time in the oil and gas business. In 1993, she started her career as a petroleum consultant. In the mid to late 1990s, she became enamored and intrigued with the concept of horizontal drilling and underbalanced drilling and saw it as the future of the oil and gas business pursuing tight plays that are now what dominate the U.S. oil and gas business. With a partner, she drilled the first horizontal well in Nagadoshes County. She kept working on her methodology for almost a decade. She set out on her own to pursue her dream deal with a big, well-funded company. Toby has two sons and being a mom to them gave her strength. She wanted to show and teach them by example that they must work hard, tell the truth, and stand up for themselves even when it's really hard. In 1997 and for the next eight years, 
Toby analyzed data on East Texas oil and gas formations to identify locations in the James Lime Plain, which underlies five counties between Tyler and Nagadoches, Texas. At the time, most energy companies avoided the formation, which was thought to be difficult to develop due to geological composition. She correctly determined that gas production could be enhanced with horizontal drilling designed to intersect and drain multiple fractures while optimizing the potential for payout from the James Lime and the deeper production zones. Toby's research encompassed 2.75 million acres across five counties in Texas and into Louisiana and consumed thousands of hours spent analyzing every shred of publicly accessible well data and historical production records from every well in the five county area including a handful of successful James Lime vertical wells. Toby meticulously created a uniquely comprehensive study and an annotated map of the James Lime's production potential, treasure map of the best localized sweet spots, top tier stacked pay prospect areas for drilling the James Lime formation in East Texas, ultimately identifying 10 stacked pay sweet spots. In search of a working relationship with a big, well-funded energy company and armed with her vast amount of amazing research, in February of 2005, Toby made a presentation of the results of her study to Southwestern Energy Production Company under a written confidentiality agreement. It's important to note that at the time of the presentation, Southwestern had not acquired any mineral leases with James Lime as the primary drilling objective had never drilled a James Lime well and had been dissuaded from pursuing James Lime ventures by an internal study conducted in 2003. In fact, the James Lime play was not approved by Southwestern management as a primary objective prior to meeting Toby. After Southwestern signed the confidentiality and non-compete agreement, Toby provided detailed information about the entire area she had studied and worked for eight years. The presentation materials emphasized the stack pay potential of the James Lime prospects. Southwestern declined to pursue Toby's detailed proposal that she had showed on the sweet spot treasure map, but unbeknown to Toby. Following her protected confidential meeting with Southwestern, they secretly embarked upon their own James Lime play. As early as March 11, 2005, the month after accessing Toby's data and treasure map, Southwestern's internal drilling documents identified the James Lime as a primary drilling objective. And remember, they had declined to do business with her. Southwestern launched an aggressive acquisition of lease interest and actively pursued drilling in the areas Toby had identified as sweet spots. In November, 2005, they completed a structure map of the James Lime with Travis Peak production. Its trend lines and markings and circles correlated to the data Toby provided at the February 2005 presentation, an additional request made by Southwestern. The map appeared to bear subtle pen and pencil markings distinctively tracing trend line and sweet spot notations that Toby had identified. By the fall of 2010, Southwestern had acquired at least 1,888 leases and drilled more than 140 wells, 88 of them James Lime horizontal wells in areas clustered around the sweet spots Toby had identified. And not surprisingly, there was no lemon in the bunch. In fact, Southwestern's wells had a 100% success rate and had generated an undisputed $381,500,000 in production revenue prior to the time of trial. Today, for the first time on National Network TV, the insider exclusive investigative network TV series visits with Toby Berry Helfand and her lawyer, Perry Zibley, partner at Chandler Mathis Zibley, to discuss her landmark legal case against Southwestern and her long legal journey and eventual settlement to get justice where the evidence from the court record clearly showed 
that Southwestern Energy had no interest or plans in the drilling of the James Lime Formation prior to obtaining Toby's trade secret. That Southwestern's energy internal studies showed that the formation was not economically viable. How the jury saw that Southwestern had in fact exploited her trade secret to its benefit and to her detriment. Plus, the jury saw a secret email that was produced in January of 2009 by a third party, which revealed that Southwestern had Toby's deal and shared the trade secret with others. This was overwhelming clear evidence that Southwestern knew its conduct was shady and knew what they did to Toby was wrong and not industry standard, but was apparently standard for Southwestern's management. In Southwestern's annual report for 2016, filed in February of 2017, Southwestern stated that the case was settled confidentially and that they were found to have misappropriated Toby's trade secret by the Texas Supreme Court. The Texas Supreme Court opinion in this case is a landmark decision on the law of misappropriation of trade secrets and the standard for proving damages in trade secret cases. What made it even more impactful was that Toby was a lone woman standing up against big oil in Texas and that the Texas Supreme Court stood by her and found that her trade secret had indeed been misappropriated and that Southwestern made millions by doing so. As a result of filing this case, Toby Barry Helfen has been blackballed in the oil and gas industry like most whistleblowers and trailblazers. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Houston, Texas. It is my great pleasure to introduce Perry Zibley to the show. Welcome to the show, Perry. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your firm. What type of law do you practice? Well, we are a small boutique firm. We have an office here in Houston, Texas, and also in East Texas and Lufkin, Texas. And we do almost 100% civil litigation. Mm -hmm. That's what kind of law we practice. And what type of people do you generally represent? We represent the plaintiff side of the bar. Okay. That means people that are... Um, by and large, bringing lawsuits. Yeah. Today we are here discussing a case that went on for a long time. What was it, 11 years? Yes, 11 years. Went to the Texas Supreme Court, and it's a case about trade secret misappropriation, right? That's correct. Tell our audience a little bit about your client, Toby Helfand. Well, Toby Helfand is a um, geophysicist and a female, mm -hmm. and she, uh, worked for banks and decided one day that she was going to look at an area, five county area in East Texas and worked on this project for probably 10 years, right. looking at every single oil well that yeah. had been drilled in that area. When you say worked on the project, she spent her time, her money, she wasn't being paid to examine this, all these maps and found formations and that sort of thing. She did it by herself. That's correct. But she knew one thing, once she acquired a knowledge which was very valuable, she didn't have the resources to be able to go in and drill that area and make a lot of money, right? That's correct. And, and the research that she did took thousands of, uh, of hours. Yes. Um, encompassed this very, very 2.75 million acres is mm -hmm. the area that she looked at. And she looked at every piece of publicly available information right. in that area on every well that had ever been drilled. Mm -hmm. so, and once she had it, what'd she do? Well, she she created uh, what we called the treasure map. Right. And the treasure map where she would actually plot and annotate all of her uh, findings regarding these oil wells that she had researched. And she was trying to find uh, the best areas in this five county area to drill what's called a James Line formation right. well. Then she had to find a company with the money to be able to drill these wells and make some sort of deal with them, right? That's right. And she, she, she's an intelligent woman. She knew that 
when you go to a company with valuable information, they, you know, there's a possibility that they could steal it. Or take advantage of it. Take advantage of it, right? Right. And that's what this case is all about. But to protect herself, she had what kind of, uh, what kind of agreement signed? Well, she she floated this idea past uh, several different large oil and gas uh, exploration yes. companies, and she she was very wise to obtain what's called a confidentiality or a non disclosure agreement. Yes, that I'm going to share this information with you. I'm going to share my idea. I'm going to share my trade secret that it is valuable. Yeah, and in return, you're going to agree. If you if you're not inter if you if you are interested in the trade secret right. and we can strike some kind of deal that's great if you're not interested in it you're agreeing not to use it um, to my detriment or to your benefit or, or to my exclusion right now in these kinds of agreements there's usually a time period where the company that she presents this to can't act on it without her permission. And I believe that time period was one year. That is correct. So let me ask you, legally, at the end of one year, one year and one day, could a company, once they were presented this information, could they go ahead and use it to their advantage? Well, that's what they thought. and um, But they started moving on it prior to that time, didn't they? Right. We were able to establish that the very month after they met with Toby, yeah. they started acquiring a large volume of leases in these areas that some, she had pointed out. I think about 1,888 leases, right? That's correct. On properties that they had never, in fact, internally, they had said this property is worthless, right? They had, internally, they had done a study on the James Line formation, which yeah. is a geographic strata, and they had determined internally that it was not a viable economic strata mm -hmm. to explore. So let's get back to, that's the one-year limitation. This right. is a landmark case, isn't it? Yes, it is. And why is it a landmark case? Well, because it, it kind of carved out the law, clearly enunciated the law on trade secret misappropriation in Texas. And what's one of the most difficult things about trade secrets is to how to quantify damages, which yes. is part of what you've got to prove. <clears throat> yeah. And so the court went through a lot of detailed analysis of, uh, in our particular case, um, the, the evidence was there that, th that she was damaged, but it wasn't quantified properly. Right. And so the, ultimately that's what the court said, you need to go back and retry this case. Right. Um, because we agree that there's been a misappropriation of a trade secret here. We agree that there's damages, but the measure of the damages needs to be more clearly uh, okay. demonstrated. So um, in the legal world, lawyers like to use nice jargon, big long words like misappropriation. Right. But in reality, this is really called theft. Just a, just stealing. That's yeah, it. Stealing. That's and right. Let me get back to this, what you mentioned a minute ago. After one year, can a company misappropriate information they got after the non-disclosure, non-circumvention agreement has expired? Well, uh, they could had they not taken steps during the one-year period. So you would have to prove, and you did. Yes, and we did. We actually proved that they took advantage of the right. trade secret information. Yeah. And it was kind of circumstantially, they held on to her materials for a number of months and yeah. drug their feet and uh, were giving every indication that they were going to go forward in a deal with her. Mm -hmm. and unbeknownst to her, they were going and acquiring these leases in the areas that yeah. she had pointed out to them. Yeah, and I understand they drilled 88 wells that she had identified before, and all 88 came in, right? Right. Well, they actually drilled 140 wells, right. but 88 of them were in the James Line formation. Which she had pointed out to Which them. she had pointed out. So let me ask you, in the oil industry, um, what is usually the percentage of success when you drill a, a well? It's not 100% yeah, ever, <laughs> ever. What, what is it, like 50%, 25%? I don't know. But so they I, had an amazing success rate. They had an amazing success, not okay. one single dry hole. Okay. What evidence were you able to present in court to show that they had, and I'm going to use this word, stole her information? Well, just we had to go and research um, the leases and yeah. when they started acquiring the leases and it just coincided with the time period that she had disclosed and met mm -hmm. with them and disclosed their trade secret her mm -hmm. trade secret so the fact you could show that they had acquired the lease after she had made her presentation made it very clear 
Right. And not after one year, right? Right. Within the one year. Within the one year. And that was a key thing, right? That that was one of the key factors okay. in the case, and yes. some other evidence, I understand that some of the maps had been traced. That's right. Uh, so she had this big, huge uh, treasure map that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. That where she had put the annotations of every single well that had ever been drilled that she could find public information on right. in this five county area. And she had certain PowerPoint presentations she had made um, to Southwestern Energy at the time mm -hmm. she met with them in February of 2005. And as, as a result, they took those, um, th th there's what's called a structure map. Um, of a formation and it's kind of like a topographical map but underground right so it shows the rises and falls of a particular formation and so they created what's called a, st a structure map for the top of the James Lyme formation mm -hmm. and in doing so they produced this document to us and it was created in November of 2005 which was within the year time period yes. And they had taken, after we blew the exhibit up that they tendered to us electronically, and if you blow it up like 400 times, you could see these subtle trace marks, these pencil marks right. that they had drawn on the map, obviously during a meeting. And of course, the copy we received was just a, uh, it was a PDF. It was just an electronic document. But the map that they created was one that you right. would put on a wall or on a big blackboard during a meeting, and obviously they had drawn on yeah, it. Yeah, it reminds me of the axiom, the devil is in the details, right? That's right. Blow it up and you see it, right? That's right. Now, there was also a smoking gun email, wasn't there? That's right. Tell That's right. a little bit about well, that. Well, the smoking gun email was after they had met with um, Toby. Mm -hmm. They had some other uh, joint venture partners, another oil and gas company, and they that company produced an email to us. Um, that basically where Southwestern, the defendant in our case, had notified their joint venture partner that they had taken a piece of Toby's deal mm -hmm. and that they may want to go out there and acquire more of her deal. Which they were acknowledging that they were stealing it, basically. Well, they shouldn't have even been telling this other third <laughs> right. party about the deal. Yeah. And they didn't they didn't um, they didn't take a piece of the deal, but they were encouraging this third party to go take a piece of the deal yeah. and to tell her that that they heard about it on the street, not yeah. from not from Southwestern. Right. So tell our audience a little bit about you went to trial. And, right. And how long did it take to get to trial? by the way, initially, the first trial. Well, the case was filed in 2006, and right. the case went to trial in 2010, so okay. four, four years. Four years. Right. Okay. And the reason I want to bring this up is because when someone has been wrong, sometimes it takes a long time. On behalf of your firm, you're up against Southwestern. Right. They got big-time lawyers. Absolutely. They're yeah. paying them a lot of money. They've hired the, the best, one of the best law firms in town. Yeah, and you're taking this case on contingency. That's right. Which means your law firm's spending a lot of money. We're spending a lot of money, and we're not going to get paid for our work or our time or the money we invest in it unless we win the case for her. Okay, so tell us what happened at the first case, the first trial. The trial uh, started the Monday after yeah. Thanksgiving in 2010, and... It was a two-week trial. She was on the stand for three, four, maybe five days. Uh, we started the trial with her as our Exhibit A, our number yeah. one. Um, I got the drew the straw to present her and do the direct examination of her. Mm -hmm. And then they did a very, which was pretty short, uh, less than a day. Yeah. And then they got to come and just tried to hammer her, and they really banked on the fact that she would make a very poor witness in front of a jury. They had taken her deposition and had gotten her very emotionally upset during her deposition, and they were really banking on the fact that they could make her look bad. That didn't work. It did didn't it? happen. Yeah, because from my understanding, she has an encyclopedic memory about she, everything that she's studied. Right? That, that's <laughs> right. She We call it the photographic memory. <laughs> she can remember just about any document yeah. that she's seen. Yeah, and I do want to point out, and she'll be on our show a little bit, on the show a little bit later, but I do want to point out that she is a rarity in the oil and gas old boys network, and I emphasize boys, 
very few women are in this business. That's right. right. It's the good old boys network. Yeah. In the so the business. jury, after two weeks, came in with what kind of verdict? They came in with a with a verdict for for her, one hundred percent. Yeah. There are various causes of action, uh, legal theories that we had set forth. The jury answered every question favorably for her, awarding her actual damages. And then the big one was stating the amount of profits that they had made. Which they had made, was it $380 million? $381 million in revenue. Right, in revenue. In revenue, just from the wells. Right. And that didn't include some of the properties that they divested themselves and some of the deeper rights to those properties. Right. Today we have Toby with us, so let's bring her on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Toby Barry Helfen to the show. Welcome to the show, Toby. Thank you. Boy, from the sound of things, 11 years is a long time to try and get justice, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Yeah, you in initially, you spent, from what Perry told us, almost 10 years of your own time investigating this area. Yes. Right, in East Texas. So when you set out to investigate this is it 2.5 million acres, right, that you covered? Five counties, right? You wanted to hopefully find uh, enriched reserves, you know, profitable reserves, so that you would have a card to deal with a big company so they could drill for it and you'd make some money, right? Was that the plan? Well, it, it was still fun to me. I wanted to be out on the well. Yeah. And I wanted to hear you know, them hit a fracture and you hear the noise and it, you know, a big flare. I, I, I thought of financial, sure, yeah. but it was the thrill, the, the puzzle, the, I created that. Right. That, that was exciting to me. Right. Um, when, when you went to Southwestern initially, before you presented your, let's call it, treasure map, you know, all my this trade secret, yeah. trade secrets, right? You were smart enough to realize that you need to protect yourself, right? You didn't want them to steal it. Right. So did I uh, was, did you go to a lawyer to get a non-disclosure, non-circumvention agreement, or did you just get that from, where'd you get it from? I had been through enough. I'd had a previous partner. So you were experienced in A that. little. Yeah. I wouldn't say a lot. And when, when they signed it, they're a big company, right? They're a, a New York Stock Exchange company. When you, when you had it signed, you thought you're safe, right? Totally. 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 So <laughs> you present, you made this presentation. It was in what, one day, half a day? How long did it take? Um, it took a little over half a day. Yeah, they wanted but, you to leave the maps, didn't but, they? Oh, everything. Yeah. And then uh, actually over about a two and a half month period, everything they asked for and then some was supplied to them. Yeah. So they got... Did they, did they ever tell them. you during this two and a half months that things look good? You know, we may do oh, something. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, when when a company comes in two, three days after you've shown them something right. and they said, we like this, we want an exclusive. An exclusive did they say that to you? Oh, yes. No. What an exclusive means is you're barred Don't show it to anybody else. I'm showing it to anybody. Well, let me ask you. You ended the exclusive. Yes, I did. You made a phone call. Yes, I did. You said, you know, I'm tired of waiting, and I don't want to have this exclusivity anymore. Right. What do they say? Okay. No problem. But they were led to believe that there was never any competition. Right. When did you find out that Southwestern was using information that you had given them to their advantage? It was in January of 2009, I got a call. Four years later? Yes. Okay. I got a call from another attorney, because our original lawsuit was in 2000, early 2006, I mm -hmm. believe. February? Right. February 2006. Mm -hmm. And I got a call in uh, January 2009 that we must, Add Southwestern, mm -hmm. that they had found something at one of the third party's offices, and uh, we had to include Southwestern. So uh, okay. that's when I found out. All right. I didn't really see the reason, but I, that's when I found out. And okay. so Southwestern was added, yeah. I think, February of 2009. What was your reaction when you found out what they were doing? I was angry. How angry? Uh, more scared. Yeah, scared because big company. Scared, it's like. What am I going to do? Well, I mean, 
I'm just this little lady. <laughs> and uh, I'd already been blackballed. Yeah. Uh, could You've been blackballed because of the lawsuit, correct? Yes. Uh, okay. Totally. I yeah. mean, you know. And, and for our audience, even today, we're in 2017, 10 years later, right? Almost 10 years later, you're blackballed in this industry. And totally. And what that means is, I mean, let's look at some facts here. You discovered a very successful find, didn't you? Yes. Where somebody made a ton of money, right? Right. Yeah. And that's not too rare that people, petroleum engineers, are able to find these, you know, treasures, right? So you're successful, you have a success record, and yet, when you sue the person, the company that stole this from you, you're blackballed. I'm kind of just now getting to where I can think straight yeah. and feel relaxed. You talk yeah. about relaxed. Right. I'm just getting, it's like, okay, I can breathe now. What word do you have to say to America about being in a situation like you were, where you have been gravely wronged, by big Goliath company that has an army of lawyers, right? Don't be naive. Yeah. Uh, have a have great agreements. Yeah. Everything is about the bottom line for yeah. companies now. Okay. Money, money, money. And so if you have something that's valuable, you best protect it. Right. right. And if they steal it, you're in for the dogfight of your life. Yeah. But, but you, you need but to do it. Can, but you can do it. Yeah. And, and I can tell you how to do it. Okay, good. Save everything, right. every email, every document, document, document. Okay, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. And I'm proud of you. And I hope you start speaking and write your book, okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you handle other intellectual property type cases where people, have, their trade secrets have been misappropriated? Well, I we are not uh, IP lawyers, right. but we frequently get hired as local counsel yes. uh, in East Texas, particularly because that is the IP litigation capital of the United States. What is the law? Okay, and we were talking earlier about this in Tyler, Texas, which is federal court, correct? Tyler and Marshall, Texas, okay. federal court. What is the law regarding the misappropriation, the stealing of trade secrets in terms of disgorgement? Well, if you, if you in, in an IP context, if yeah. you take somebody's uh, trade secret or information that's patentable, you have to typically those, those individuals with those trade secrets, secrets would have some type of deal that they would strike. Yes. In, in Toby's case, it would have been an overriding royalty interest. Yes. And in, and in um, the IP context, it's usually what's called a licensing fee mm -hmm. to pay to use somebody's technology. That's a settlement kind of a thing, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Congratulations on resolving this case and for the fight that you've got, 11 years, wow. That's, yes, that's thank tremendous. you, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. All right, great, thank right. you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.